They're not leaving. Russia has moved in high, uh, aircraft, helicopters, tanks, you name it. They're not leaving. It's a fact. It's over. Assad staying. Get used to it. And here's the good news. You want to hear the good news? Even though Assad is a monster, he's a Stalinist monster and horrible, but I'll take a Stalinist monster over an Islamist monster any day. I'm less threatened by a small-time Stalinist monster than I am by a small-time Islamist monster. Because so far as I know, Assad has not sent any operatives to America uh, now or in the past to blow up schools or kill American Marines uh, at recruiting stations. But I can't say the same about your friends in the Islamic movement. So just put two and two together and you'll understand the propaganda you've been subjected to by the psychotics in the media and, and the, the fools, or I should say the fools in the media and the psychotics in the White House that, that surround the White House. I got to use these worms, these words very carefully. The good news here is that now that Assad is staying and now that the Syrian army will be able to take out ISIS along with Russia, China and Iran and get rid of all of the uh, uh, fellow travelers in the Islamic movement, Syria will be reborn and it'll be reborn probably in, in, a, in a partition. It'll be partitioned. It'll probably be partitioned into five, five parts as it once was. And the good news here is that all of these millions of refugees can go home again. And if Europe had any guts and brains, they'd deport them the minute that Syria is stable again. They would no way in a million years give them citizenship. Now, most of them are not even coming from Syria, by the way. They're economic refugees. Many of them are coming from as far away as Bangladesh to Europe, by the way, simply for, better, better, for, more, uh, for more benefits. They're passing through nations that don't have benefits. They all want to go to Germany, which is a story unto itself. How this Merkel, who was allegedly a conservative, has flipped into this left-wing fanatic overnight is hard to believe, especially since the right-wing parties have enjoyed a great resurgence in Germany. And especially on the, on the issue of immigration. How did Merkel suddenly move far to the left and say, we welcome you? That's a story for another day. Do you know what Germany fears more than the Muslims that are coming in? They fear their own conservatives, who are they calling right wing? They're smearing them. Just as Boehner is smearing conservatives in this country, calling us fanatics, same thing with the elitists in Germany, Norway, Sweden, France. They're terrified that an indigenous group of people, meaning their own population, their own population of their own religion and their own ethnicity, will stand up for their own nation. That's how sick things have become in the Western world. So things are changing right in front of our eyes, and that's why I said to you, what does the visit of the Pope, the blood moon, Syria, the UN, the Pope, what does all of this have to do with it? It's all at the same time. So I'd rather talk about these big things rather than Trump's tax plan. I hope he becomes president. I hope he puts in the tax plan. It'll save me a lot of money. That's all I care about. I pay too much in taxes. I want to pay less. I resent it. I hate the state of California because they robbed me. I hate paying 13% on top of 40%. I pay 39% federal. I pay 13% or 15% state tax. I hate it here for that reason. I hate being robbed by Jerry Brown. Okay? I hope to God something comes along to make me want to stay in the state of California. So it's very personal for me. But right now I want to talk about the bigger picture, which is the world. National security is the biggest issue in my mind. And the busting of our borders by uh, the governor of the state of California and the governors of all of these other liberal states uh, in order to gain votes is sickening. And we need nationalism, and only nationalism can save us. Only nationalism can save this country. And speaking of that, by the way, it's an interesting point. I've raised it in a previous publication in my last book, my issue of nationalism, but I came to the same conclusion again in Government Zero. Because I was asked by the publisher, what is the solution for all of this nightmare that's going on in this country right now? And I thought about it in great detail, and I frankly went back to that theme, and I talked about nationalism. But this time, instead of just writing, we need nationalism, I did an entire chapter called Saving a Nation with Nationalism. And many of you say, well, you know, Trump is too general, general he doesn't get specific enough. You could say that about Michael Savage or others in, in radio that would just talk show host and with two, we say generalized things, we just throw words out there and we don't follow it up with ideas. Well, I've written 28 books and in Government Zero, which will be out in a month, which you can get on, on Amazon and I hope you do, 
I have a whole chapter on saving a nation with nationalism. First subhead is abandoning conservatism. And then I say nationalism versus conservatism because they're not the same thing. And then in the chapter, I'm flipping through now, nationalist immigration. I talk about what kind of immigrants we do need. I then call about a chapter subhead called nationalist liberals. Now that's something interesting because no one's ever put those two words together. And I said, I often ask friends if they believe there is any chance to work within the Democratic Party. Unsurprisingly, the overwhelming majority of answers amount to a resounding no. I understand why well-meaning patriots feel this way. Certainly, there is not much chance to work with the leading Democrat politicians. They subscribe to an ideology diametrically opposed to everything we stand for. And then I talked about something else. I said, Democrat voters are another story. And I say there is a large percentage of Democrat voters who are so dependent upon the government or so anti-American that they will never join our cause. But I don't believe they're the majority. And then I said, I believe that there's a, nas a nationalist movement would attract what is either what is uh, either a majority or a significant minority of Democrat voters who are not socialists and who do not seek to destroy society and remake it in a progressive image. I believe this group of Democrats who identify as liberal simply do not see in the Republican Party as it exists today a recognition of the individual's responsibility to society that is so vital a part of a nationalist movement. I don't blame them. I don't see it either. And I said, I believe a nationalist movement would attract large numbers of this group. They are blue-collar Democrats who aren't interested in socialism or forced multiculturalism. They just don't want to live in an America where they are completely sold out to multinational corporations who have no obligation to the nation they are helping to build. They want to live in the kind of America their parents and grandparents grew up in, where there is economic freedom, opportunity, and personal liberty, tempered by a duty to preserve the nation, that makes all of that possible. Once they understand the nationalist platform, I write, I believe many of them will join us without hesitation. Has anyone said that in the conservative movement? Zero. And that is the problem, my friends. The nation has become so bifurcated and so split that people on the conservative side have given up thinking that there are any Democrats who would ever join in their belief, in their belief system of a nationalist presence. It's all wrong. Things are changing in front of our eyes. And as the world changes in front of our eyes and the United States changes in front of our eyes, there's one thing that will not change in front of your eyes. And that's me, Michael Savage. My motto has been, since 1994, borders, language, culture. I have not watered it down, nor, nor do I intend to do so. I'll be back in a moment. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. You know, obviously I'm in the media, and I'm greatly critical of the, I call, midstream media. They're laughable, they're stupid. Whatever name you want to come up with, we all know that. We have no faith in them, which is why people like myself can survive it all. I mean, if I didn't present an alternative, I wouldn't be on the radio for 21 years. So what am I getting at? Perhaps one of the dumbest in the history of the media is Ashley Banfield of CNN. She was fired for years because she was caught on air supporting the PLO, who she went out with on a killing mission one night. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Well, she did something today that is... Actually, if you can put it in the, in the pantheon of idiocy, it, is, it exceeds anything Nancy Pelosi has ever done. Okay, right after Putin spoke, I want you to listen, because I have the ears of a wolf, to what Ashley Banfield said today on CNN. Fire. I'm confident that by working together, we will make the world stable and safe, as well as provide conditions for the development of all states and nations. Thank you. Russian President Boris Yeltsin wrapping up his remarks. Or, excuse me. Boy, I'm hearkening back 20 years. Uh, Russian <laughs> President Putin wrapping up his remarks. <laughs> okay, I, I rest my case. I rest my case. Someone wrote this. Prior to the Reformation, the church was the only source of news for the common people. Gutenberg's press was wonderful for the clergy and the educated nobility, but the common man and lesser nobles still got their news from town criers, their gossip from the local busybody, and their real news from the church. 
I have always thought our American media fills the niche that the town busybody once filled. Yes, Ashley, you know more than a gossip. That's all you are, a town busybody talking over a clothing line with your hair up in a babushka holding a, a, a cold cup of coffee. So that, that's my point of, uh, she called him Boris Yeltsin. So anyone can make a mistake. Really, on CNN, your reliable source of news calling Vladimir Putin Boris Yeltsin? That's a minor slip? Is it really? Especially, and by the way, that's why they're, why, when they're reading a teleprompter. I, Michael Savage, don't read teleprompters. I prompt my own self. It's that simple. So let's go to some of the callers. 855-407-282. Got some great callers out there. We got 48 seconds to get to them in this segment. I mean, time is marching on. Time is the enemy. You know, time is the enemy of a talk show host when you have so much that you want to talk about. I had a sore throat all weekend. I didn't think I'd make it to the show till I healed myself. And uh, I, I really did. It was a bad one. It was deep. You know, one of those sore throats that's deep. And I had one in January that was so bad, I had to take antibiotics along with all the nutrition, nutrients that I use. It took me months, really, to get over that one. And here I am again. I said, oh, God, not again. Well, I did all the things I know to do. Massive doses of C, A. Big doses of A really help an awful lot. And I took some of the herbs and the herbal drinks. I gargled vodka and spat it out in the sink. That, that really works well. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. So we get many people up on the uh, on the air. Just as a side note, I, I, I don't know how many people watch... Uh, uh, what's it called, Danny? I can't remember the name of these shows uh, with John Void. I can't remember it. Danny, uh, Danny Rose? No, I, no, last night. I don't know the name of the show. It's kind of fun. I watch it every Sunday night. Why is it blanking out? I, I just can't remember it. Ray Donovan, Ray Donovan. I can't believe it. I can't even remember the name. It was it was so good last night. The writers were newer. This you know last episode. I really enjoyed it. And the murder scene where they took out the Armenian Mafia was original to television. I don't want to give out a spoiler, but that was pretty well done. And the last scene of, uh, of the John Void character topping even his rotten mean son in, in, in ruthlessness and uh, such. I'm going to watch that again tonight. It was really uh, quite well done. I even like the, uh, the end where he goes to the priest for confession after he didn't believe in God. And how uh, the actor whose name I forget, who I didn't like in the beginning. I think he's grown into the role. He's much better. He looks tougher, better lighting. Shriver looks great, looks great playing the part. Well, when he broke down in the confessional, talking about uh, the priest he had shot because he had raped him when he was a boy repeatedly, when he breaks down crying to the priest that he didn't kill him because he hated him, he killed him because he loved him. He, had, he killed him because he actually cared for the priest. I thought that was an amazing twist on this whole molestation deal. And then the dynamics of the other brother who had been molested by the same priest when they were boys, who is now married to that Mexican lady, is so well played out. So it's really the most developed developed script, I think, in the media. And uh, exciting, enough, you know, I would say enough titillation in it to satisfy the average viewer like myself. Enough violence, <laughs> enough violence to keep me <laughs> listening. And by the way, just an all-around great production. So I'm glad none of them were killed off because that means season three, I get to watch them again. Uh, the, you know, I, I thought they'd kill off somebody in this one. But why kill off a good character? That guy from England, English actor is the great Marsan, Eddie Marsan, Marsan, who plays the guy with the cross on his arm, the kind of boxing brother who's got Parkinson's. He's always been great. I first saw him in a British movie uh, called, uh, 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 what was it called? One of the uh, Gangster one, gangster Number One, 20 years ago, where he plays a small-time crook living in a public housing development in England, and a really bad guy comes to intimidate him, and how he breaks down in tears and starts to cry in that scene was awesome. I never forgot how good his acting was. So I really loved the, uh, the show last night. Oh, well, now what have I got to look forward to? What's coming up now? I don't even know what's coming up in TV now in terms of high production. Now that that's gone, what's back on the air? The Affair is coming back. That was a middling drama, not bad. I think it's on the same network. I'm not sure about that one. And then uh, it's a shame uh, Boardwalk Empire's finished, right? That's over with. I got used to him. I got used to uh, 
the Schmendrick who played the, the gangster. I, I got used to all the characters. They're gone. It's gotten so bad on TV, I'm watching Supreme.